Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, Janine Davidson here. I'm the president of Metropolitan State University of Denver. We're here today to talk with Senator Bennett about work-based learning opportunities and all the great stuff that is happening in higher education and at MSU Denver in particular. Here come now. And there he is. Welcome. Hi there, Madam President. How are you? I'm great. How are you, Senator? I'm doing, I'm doing really well, too, although I'm not in Colorado. Uh, well, it's kind of rainy here, but, you know. We need it. We need it. Yeah. We need it. Yeah. I'll take credit for the rain and not give it to John Hickman. <laughs> well, great. Thanks for joining us today to talk about one of my favorite topics, and I know it's one of yours, uh, work-based learning and apprenticeships. I know. So why don't what, I introduce the bill and I can talk a little bit about it in a minute. But I know one of the reasons I'm so excited about it is that I've met the students at MSU Denver that are taking advantage of the apprenticeships that you provide. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how meaningful those are on your campus and why they help people get decent paying jobs when they're done yeah. with school. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, we are really excited about all apprenticeship opportunities and work-based learning in general. You know, when you talk to college students today and you say, hey, why are you going to college? 80, 90% of them say to get a better job. <laughs> so they want that connectivity to employers. And that's one of my personal goals. And I know lots of other university presidents. I'd like to see 100% of our students have an opportunity to have some sort of a work-based learning apprenticeship uh, opportunity so they can get in with an employer before they graduate so they can see whether this is the industry that's for them they can really hone their skills you know and I'll say um, most of our students are interested in this their most popular areas are like construction management cybersecurity healthcare professions um, advanced manufacturing we have a lot in the aerospace industry also which is a very important industry as you know in uh, Colorado um, and I'll say one more interesting tidbit that really got my attention when I got this job. And, um, you know, LinkedIn has all this great data about uh, graduates and students. And what they discovered was this weird paradoxical set of data, which is that um, something like 65% of what you would consider entry level jobs for people with bachelor's degrees require three years of experience. So query how you have three years of experience for an entry level job, you're gonna have to have apprenticeships and work-based learning opportunities. So that's another reason why we're very excited about all of this. And how do you guys work with employers, you know, to, to set this up? I remember sitting there with the, about, I don't know, there are probably 15 different students who are covering the gamut of everything you're talking about. Lockheed was part of it. I know there, there are other employers as well, construction trades and other kinds of things. I mean, how do you find the, the, the folks? Sure. And are, or yeah. are they pounding on your door? Both. It's both. Um, I mean, I think we've developed a reputation for really wanting to work with industry. Um, myself and my senior leadership are out in the community talking to, to businesses all the time. And we have a thing called the Classroom to Career Hub where we have industry navigators whose job it is to talk to the employer and help them figure out what they need. And it has to go both ways, right? Because um, a lot of companies may not know the best way to craft these programs. So we have to work with them to craft the program that is meaningful for the employer and also meaning, meaning for, for the student. Um, the other thing is to get the employers in sort of left of the timeline of graduation. So they actually help us with our curriculum. So the Lockheed example is really great. The aerospace community here in um, Colorado sat down with us and said, you know, what skill sets are you missing? What do you need? And they helped us really craft the curriculum and our co-op program. So what that is, is um, it's like an apprenticeship where a student gets more than just a sort of making coffee and shuffling papers. Um, they're actually building, you know, spaceships, you know, <laughs> lucky <laughs> 20 hours a week, they get credit. And then, you know, at the end of those programs, um, they're getting hired by these companies and it's really fabulous. They're, they're literally bring, building spaceships that are gonna take us to Mars. It's amazing. Yeah, they literally are, they literally are. So yeah, I just think it's um, for, for employers and you know, we have a big hiring crunch everywhere. There's a huge um, need for talent. And in, in Colorado in particular, as you know, 
lot of these companies have been recruiting talent from out of state. When we have it right here, if we all just get together and get left of the graduation timeline and work it together in these sort of ways. So, and I know in Washington, you are working on uh, something pretty important, right? Well, I think, uh, you know, I, I think the getting left of the graduation timeline is actually exactly what we're trying to do too. I mean, I used to be, as you know, the superintendent of Denver Public Schools before I was in this job. And I've come to the conclusion over the years that I don't think anybody should graduate from high school without the skills to earn a living wage, not just the minimum wage. That's not good enough. And there's no reason why that curriculum, as you said, can't be changed in ways that, is, that will, will allow employers to say, yeah, we're gonna pay a living wage for that. And today in Denver, through CareerWise and some other stuff that we're doing there, there are kids that are going to school three days a week and they're going to an employer two days a week. They're getting paid and while they um, and when they graduate, if they want to, they can go join, you know, Pinnacle Insurance is a good example, mm -hmm. a company that where, where they're doing it at, with a living wage job and then later make a judgment. Okay, now I want to go to MSU Denver and I want to learn this and maybe I want to work toward a bachelor's degree. I've met a, a young woman who, uh, who, had, who had done that and had, had ended up deciding not to go to college. Five years later, she made a decision to go to college. Her sister was with me and with her, her older sister and said, this would have been so great when I was in school. I just decided I was gonna go get a criminal justice degree. I didn't actually, have, turned out I wasn't interested in that. And if I had had the chance to experience some employment, learn about some possibilities. Yeah. So what we're trying to do at the national level is basically blow out what you're doing at MSU Denver and what we're trying to do at Denver Public Schools and say to universities and say to employers and say to you know, students and their families, you know, we need to start thinking about this in the sixth grade. That's not too yeah. soon to think yeah. about it. So that we can get the curriculum aligned so that when you're graduating, you're either going to MSU Denver because you're ready to go to college or you're going to an employer who'll pay you a living wage because you want to do that. And in the meantime, or when, you, when you're either at, at high school or on MSU Denver's campus, that you're getting paid by somebody who when you finish, you know, you can get employed by them. So sure. there are no original ideas here. This is just ripping off the stuff that you're already doing so well. <laughs> well, and building on the great work you were doing as superintendent, and we really appreciate the emphasis you put on education. It's, it's super, super important. Um, and you, you pointed something out there, which is that blurring of the line between work and school and blurring of the line between K-12 and higher ed. Right. We're really trying to get those pathways we find the average student in America, they have these zigzaggy lives, which is fine. And we all want to, we want higher ed to be able to capture that wherever you are in your life, in your career journey, that we can help you upskill on the one hand. On the other hand, these experiential learning, uh, work-based learning uh, apprenticeships, they also help students figure it out faster. So they're not starting and stopping one like you described. They can kind of get into the area where they love and go for it. So I actually yeah. was with a with a company the other day that was telling me that uh, Red Bull was moving, the, you know, they're moving something from from Germany to New Mexico. And they were so worried about the lack of work, folks that would be qualified in the workforce that they were actually bringing with them the, the whole training system as well. Because as you know, in Germany, they have a very robust, robust apprenticeship training. I mean, I, I'm glad they're doing that because I'm glad they're moving to New Mexico to put, put in some stuff there. But there really is no reason why our existing yeah. universities and our existing K-12 system can't get much better aligned. And if we did, I think we'd see that we transform the lives of millions of Americans and, and frankly transform the American economy, and which is really needed because for 50 years, we've had an economy that's worked really well for the people at the very top and hasn't worked so well for everybody else and where there hasn't been the kind of economic mobility of people being able to move from you know one stage of income to something else. That's what education is supposed to provide and if education is relevant to the skills people need to actually get paid, as you said, I think it would radically change outcomes for a lot of people. Yeah, I think it, it's interesting that Germany model um, that we we went and looked at um, to think about how to how to blend and blur these lines. 
Um, I think the other part is also important, which is to give, you know, college credit for some of your work experience, which we're also doing. I mean, a lot of uh, military experience and military training um, people can get credit for. And um, we're trying to expand that into other industries as well. So not to water down the educational experience, but to recognize that there's a lot of learning going on. And that also, I think you're totally right, and I'm biased as a college president, but that we can do this. We don't need the companies building their own little mini universities out there. It's just, you know, much better to have this system that works. Yeah, and have a system, you know, the kind of credential you're talking about. I meet people all the time who have served in the military or who have spouses who, you know, who served with, the, with somebody in the military. They come to Colorado and, and they need, you know, we've, we've actually done some work in the state on this, make sure that that credentialing also doesn't get in the way. It's all these little things, mm -hmm. you know, that if mm -hmm. we just were better aligned, I think we'd, we'd be making a huge difference. You know, another area that is aligned with this is um, public service. And I know something also important to you is you have been a public servant most of your, a lot of your career. But the federal government, state and local, but especially the federal government, lots of career opportunities there. And so we're working with um, your office. Thank you. We have an intern in your office right now, I think. Um, so, I mean, we talk a little bit about public service and how that plays into work-based, you know, experiential learning. I think that, first of all, we do have MSU Denver interns. So if people want to apply for Colorado or for Denver, please do. We'd, lo we'd love to have you. And you know, I, I think it works very much the same as in the private sector. It gives people an exposure to something they might not otherwise see. I feel so lucky because mm -hmm. I've had this kind of checkered career of, in business and in, and, in, and in the public sector. And, you know, I think it's very useful to have those the different sets of experience, different perspectives. Mm -hmm. And, and I, so I, I, I encourage that. And even if people think, they want to work in the private sector job, having a chance, you know, to do something else, journalism or something in the public sector, just to get some exposure. If no, if for no other reason, you, you'll read the newspaper differently for the rest of your life as yeah. a result of that. And that's really what we need in this democracy is people, you know, that are engaged in its work, whether you're in the public sector, the private sector, the nonprofit, it does not matter. We need every single person to roll up their sleeves and do the work because the democracy is fragile. Getting exposure to this kind of stuff, as a, particularly as a young person, I think it'll stick with you the rest of your life. And, and by the way, because of, partly because of your advocacy, partly because it's the right thing to do, we're paying our interns in, in Washington, yes. D.C., which we, didn't, we actually didn't used to do on Capitol Hill. More offices are starting to, to join us in that effort. Yeah, I can't tell you how important that is. I mean, I, you know, but to our listeners and our viewers, um, you know, our students, 85% of them, and this is the norm for college students, are working, you know. And so it's hard for them to quit their job to take an unpaid internship. So if, if we can make them paid, but even more so if we can have, um, you know, the, like a co-op model or apprenticeship model where it's really a big integral part of the educational experience that is compensated, that is transformational. Yeah, and as I said earlier, I think that's that's true of high school kids too. You know, it gives them sure. a sense of the, a sense of possibility. I, I remember I was at that Pinnacle Assurance, the company I mentioned earlier, which is a reinsurance company, and these kids were explaining what reinsurance was. I didn't have any idea what it was, and one of the kids said. I want to tell you one other thing. And I said, yeah, tell me. They said, the only way I would have been in this building ever um, if I weren't in this program is if I'd come with my mom when she came to clean a building like this. You know, but because I've been here, I now realize, I now know what this is, what this reinsurance is, and I know I'm going to be able to graduate and come work here. And in fact, that young woman is working there now. I mean, it just That's gives amazing. you a real sense of possibility. Yeah, possibilities are, are endless there, absolutely. So is there anything else you want to tell the, our viewers here about what, what, what's going on in Washington and how these things connect in your mind? I know it's something that you are, you're yeah. passionate about. 
Sure. I mean, I'd say in Washington, we're hopefully getting this, uh, this bill passed that's going to be really important on climate change. But I'm making no guarantees because we don't know if we have every vote, but we are working on that. But I would say overall, you know, the, the, the challenge that I'm trying to address is that we've had an economy that for 50 years, as I said, has worked really well for the top 10 percent of Americans, hasn't worked for anybody else. That is a threat to our democracy, because when people give up hope that they can have opportunity in a democracy, that's when someone shows up and says, I alone can fix it. You don't need a democracy. You don't need the rule of law. You expect the world to be corrupt. And I don't think we have to accept that. We've got an amazing opportunity right now. We're passing, uh, Madam President, as you know, you're going to know, we're passing this semiconductor bill, I hope, in the House today Good. that's going to bring back semiconductor manufacturing, as you know, because of your military service, literally 95% of the most significant silicon chips that we have in our, in our airplanes, in our Air Force, um, mm -hmm. uh, relies on, on, on Taiwanese technology, you know, and we just, as a national security matter, That's right. we can't do that anymore. And so this is the first bill, if we pass it in a long, long time, that's prioritizing something other than just making stuff as cheaply as possible in China or in Southeast Asia and hoping that somehow we're going to do okay as an economy. We figured out that doesn't work, and I'm really excited about this. That is a great, um, I think a lot of people were eyes, eyes opened during the pandemic to the fragility of our supply chain and exactly. um, what's, we're very focused on advanced manufacturing also at, at MSU Denver, but um, I'm glad to hear about the, the microchip and nanochip efforts in Washington because I do think it's a national security issue <laughs> outside of higher ed, but um, you're making all the connections that I often make to the value of education um, and the core strength of our democracy, which is another reason why I'm so focused on getting MSU Denver students into Washington, because we need to, you know, democratize that democracy. We need to open people's eyes to how much of uh, it, it's all of our responsibility and it's all of our opportunity to participate. And I really appreciate the work you do for Colorado and for our Well, students. I appreciate everything you do. And I will say this, the students that I met around the table at MSU Denver the last time I was there who were involved in this, in, in this apprenticeship work and in, in were, 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 were students who said, I could have gone to this school, I could have gone to that school, but I came to MSU Denver because you provide those opportunities and walking through the labs and being able to see students actually, you know, learning the technical stuff that they are then going to apply, you know, back in Lockheed or manipulating the, the, the modeling and all that. I mean, it's just amazing to see. And um, it's, it's, it's just come a long way under your leadership. And I'm very, very grateful. Thank you. And we're grateful for your support. All right. I hope I'll see you soon in person. Yeah, come back to Colorado. It, you know, in Colorado, not here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Take care. <laughs> all right, see bye. Bye. Let's hope it rains some more. Yeah. <laughs>